So we were there, Michelle and I were just in the kitchen talking about exactly what Philip left us with last time, uh, which was that wonderful question on how do you know, like, when someone's doing enough or doing what they can? That was the question, right? How do you know when someone is doing what they can? And I just think that's such a tremendous question. Like when you see someone doing something and you have this sense of, no, they could do better. It's an interesting question because if you think someone can do better when they can't, it's almost oppressive, right? It seems like immoral, but then it also kind of seems immoral to let someone settle when they could do better. Uh, and then likewise, how do you judge yourself? How do you know when you yourself can do better? Um, you know, because we're all full of self-deception and we like to see ourselves in the best light. So maybe we're just telling ourselves we can do the best we can when really we're just saying that so we don't have to do something difficult. It seems like it's tied up in questions of self-deception. Is it something about doing, if someone is doing what they can, it is an experience of beauty? Is it an experience of some sort of unfolding reality? It's a very interesting question. So I'd be curious if you have any opening thoughts and I'll give it to Michelle as well. Immediately, everything I think comes when it comes to interpersonal dynamics and mental health, it comes down to measure, mm. which is directly related to beauty. Um, and that, that's a, that's always the tension point about it because that because the the predication of like capacity is right. That's based that's based on that's second to masses. Uh, so as a result, that's based on potentiality and actuality of essence. And ex in execution and the actualization of that essence. Um, basically, we don't expect human beings to act like dogs because we're not dogs, right? Nor do we expect human dogs to be like humans. So there's a, that's what we mean by nature, this kind of association. And those create mental models and measures of a standards of expectation. Um, no one really likes that anymore to really acknowledge, oh, <laughs> still skiing. Yeah, we're asking your question from last week. He's still skiing. Like Thursday is ski day. So we're asking the question, how can you tell when somebody is doing what they can? And Mr. Jockin was speaking. Mr. Jockin, please. I mean, boy, there are some people who prefer some people prefer to spend 40 days in the desert. Oh, see, like, that was I was about to say. I exactly like Dan, you make the assumption he's going once per week. It always tends to be Thursday. That's not yeah. insured. Daniel has horror stories from like a ski field trip. It's 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 quite comical when he retells the stories. Yeah, usually because I like fall over and start convulsing. That hump, you know, like what we were talking about with with doing what you can. Mm. Um, one of the things I think that that brings a lot of resentment to people nowadays is it's really tough to be born to someone else. And a lot of things are are really decided on a societal level. Like what you can do comes down to a genetic lottery. Mm. Um, but certainly not all. And I'm really interested, and I'm actually interested, Jock, and if, if Aristotle has anything to say about this. Um, if there's like a way of becoming more virtuous in the sense that... Uh, you can do certain things to give you like a closer access to the good, the beautiful and the true uh, during your life. That is almost like a transcendence of um, what may have been fated for people that were born at that level. If taken, uh, if read by like a societal account. This is the idea of like some kind of like virtuous rags to riches story. Hmm. There's a lot. To, I mean, you're asking good questions, Phil. There's a lot to say to that. I mean, I think first thing immediately keeps the mind Eudemian Ethics Book 8 is a really fascinating statement by Aristotle that the life, the best life, the most noble life is the life that is with all the equipment, resources, and everything that's associated and friends associated with the contemplation and love of God. That's the best life. And things that take you away from that or by excess or deficiency is a bad life. There's like, that, that's very fascinating. Aristotle is very clear on that point in the demon ethics. Um, but I've, always, I, I've said many times, I've always said, Aristotle, it's not an accident. We have two ethics. We have Eudemian and we have Nikimaki. There's a reason why we have two, because the rules book for one group is not the same as the other book. Um, because that's the other point. I've said many times, Philip, in this in this group, the idea of 
uh, tell me your zip code. I'll tell you your destiny. It's a fact. Like it's, there's so much you can know about a person by just knowing what zip code they reside in. Socioeconomic status, what health conditions they have, what probably what work their line of work they're doing. A lot of their status is allocation definition has been given to them by the accent of a zip code, let alone you're born in Uzbekistan versus, you know, somewhere else, you somewhere in the United States. All those those destinies have a huge effect on your life. Um, so that does and Aristotle does have accounts on that, certainly on the point of obviously uh, and Plato too, and Mino he talks about this, right? There is definitely we have respond we have social responsibilities that whom that have articulations of virtue that are different, right? So as a result, uh, the excellence of doing generalship is not the same as the excellence as being a carpenter or whatever. And in fact, the things that, but then it's actually some so there's like that part, but then there's also other lines and comments about one of the main distinctions also is what those individuals love. For example, the geometer loves geometry. Their desire and apprehension of geometry is what makes them distinct from other people. Um, and there's also lines, there's also, I'm kind of stumping around because it's not, I don't think Aristotle has a really systematic account to your point, Bill, because you're asking questions that are kind of beyond that discussion. Because uh, there was very rigid social structures back then. That's kind of the point. It's like, that's why this is a little weird to talk about now is that you can't really map on Aristotle's account directly, but there's just interesting notes in it. I'm bringing that up because this last note about what one loves is an indicator of the character of a person. Because um, there's a comment that the circles, the value, the, the degree of knowledge and depth of knowledge required to know the circle of the geometer is not the same as the carpenter. They are both using the circle. They're engaging with it, but their purposes of it, their need of knowing it is different. There's different levels of intensity of having to know. Um, so obviously what probably happens is as more social, li more social liberalism occurs, especially middle age period, there's a re there's a rearticulation of Aristotle's ethics in Christian and basically Aquinas discussions, right? About the basically the idea of, of a man's station, a person's station in their lives has certain virtues attached to it. So that's the way they they address that question over there. Um, but I think actually before you got on the call, Philip, we were meditating on the basic larger question, right? Of assessing people what they can and cannot do. By the way, so that's a fact. Job that's a huge. There's some huge metaphysical implications of that. Because I was saying before you got on the call, the notion of ha things having capacities to be something and not be something is a, is a, it's a doctrine of essence and nature. The idea of a man has a certain nature and man of a certain age has a certain nature. That's the point. It's like children are, we have certain permissions for children to act certain ways that we don't expect adults to. And why should we judge adults for being children, right? For basically being image, being stunted and being immature. Uh, by the way, and then, for a long time, there's a whole thing about gender dynamics and also your station in your life. I don't, this cascading bunch of uh, expectations. So even just fill up your basic question at the end of the last net was very enriching. And all three of us, before you hopped on the call, and now Javier, he's here. Uh, we all were meditating on this point. It's a very, there's some serious, you're touching, you're pushing your finger in a very serious tension of anti antiquity accounts and more modern mental health accounts. No, that's outstanding. Mr. Rivera, it's good to see you. And Philip, I think spending time off to go skiing is very noble as opposed to sitting and catching up on Netflix. So I salute you, sir, to be increasing an in expertise of an art form uh, that also puts you on the boundary between life and death, thus working on courage. So well done to face death. I appreciate it, sir. I think it's very interesting um, because it is true what's being said on the idea that you would not expect a child, say, to be able to pick up a ladder and hang it up in the garage, which may be based on a real story because I currently have an issue with a garage door. Um, but you wouldn't expect a child to do that. But if an older person, you asked them to do it and they said, I don't want to, or I can't, there would be a kind of, you're being lazy. And there would almost be a kind of reasonable, I don't, I don't know if I want to say disappointment, but a reasonable certain sense of that person is not doing what be what would be proper, given that we need to fix a problem, and it's not just an arbitrary want; it's a real mechanical issue that is not fixed. Could have ramifications, right, or stuff like that. So it's interesting how it's like a sliding sense 
of what is appropriate. But what is that based on? Is it based on you say, well, there's some sort of essence because they have muscles, because they're older, they can understand, you know, there's this kind of sense that something is developing that's fitting. Likewise, like if I think about reading people's short stories or literature, there's a sense that when someone is starting a short story or starting the craft, you would expect the story to be of a certain level, but you also would not expect it to be of an entirely, you wouldn't expect it to be Faulkner, right? And in fact, if you expected it to be Faulkner, you may crush them, uh, their hopes and dreams, and not let them get to the place where they could be Faulkner, because you're too busy reading uh, the early poetry collection that Faulkner did, the, the young Faulkner did, per se, the glass madra or something that was completely horrendous. Hemingway also did poetry when he first started that was completely horrendous. And, you know, imagine if you would have saw that and just crushed him, right? You know, you wouldn't have for whom the bell tolls or, you know, for the, the, the sun also rises, all these different things. And so it's interesting because there seems to be here real stakes in the ability to identify what a person can do and also of yourself. This isn't an arbitrary question because it also, it would seem almost impossible to not have your general relations colored by this assessment. Like if you're hanging out with friends and you believe that they can um, hold back their emotions and not just express every bit of anger that comes to mind, or if you would think that they can avoid gossip, then if they do gossip, you would be legitimate and you would feel that that would be inappropriate. So it's interesting because in one way, it's a, it's a, it seems like a, a metaphysical kind of paradox or, or quandary, but actually I think it's basically impossible to relate with human beings without some sort of sense of what they can or cannot do and to measure the appropriate fittingness or manifestation of the relationship according to that, right? But you see, I think you can see why though, relate like just taking that very premise, like, like you were saying there, Jocken, on this kind of notion of the perpetual measure. I also think there's another question. And I think it's very astute to bring up that there are two ethics in Aristotle. There's also a way to in which there's a social, political ethics in the society, but there's another ethics that's more individual and less understandable outside the person. And if you lose, it's almost like if that ethics is understood by the society, it's unethical. Like the ethics that has to be bound to the particular story and the particular relationship, if that becomes something that's understood politically, then actually you're performing. You're actually then doing what is going to get you recognition. So it's interesting how you kind of have to have both I know Matthew Stanley was talking about the esoteric and the exoteric kind of religious tradition, likewise, the public facing and the theological deep. It's interesting where almost in that ethical structure is a repetition of that. There's an ethic in the public that you need to hold, but then also aware that the, there's a certain dimension of your ethical life that will always not be fully understandable by the public and will more be bound to your family, to your immediate relations. And if you're not aware of that or you're not ready for that, then you won't be ready for a certain percentage of your life to be unintelligible to people outside your immediacy. And that could be disturbing to you when you encounter the people. But then that, that separate ethical life in the particular is also seemingly important to uh, protect yourself from capture in the Deleuzian way or to protect yourself from being completely owned by an outer life. So it's interesting how there's like a, a double move here that has to be held. But to, to, to finish the first thought, and then I'll pass it to whoever wants to speak, um, if it is impossible to relate to people without some sort of sense of fittingness or what they can or cannot do, well, that's a really cognitive, difficult thing to constantly be assessing. And when people had givens, one of my favorite words for belonging again, it probably had less you had to judge because you had like more of a macro framework in which to fit that judgment. But now it's like, oh, wait, they don't even share my worldview. So I need to understand their worldview and judge them as fitting relative to that worldview in light of my own ethics this is a really hard judgment. And isn't judgment bad? So shouldn't I not be judging? No, I'm not judging. I'm, not, I'm just trying to assess the situation. Well, how do you even do that? And then you, you blow up. You just kind of blow up. Um, and I actually took my coat off earlier too, Mr. Jockin, because I'm like, it's 70. Wow. How is this happening in the South? Whoa, we're outside. There is sunlight. Um, so this is great. But it's interesting too, because this question that has been asked 
actually seems unavoidable almost in every single relationship you go into. Uh, because once you expand it beyond the question of what they can do in regard to, say, a, a capacity, like writing a story, it also applies to the question of what they can do in a conversation to not be um, angry or short-tempered or lippy or, you know, helping you with things. Like, it's there all the time. And I do wonder if the loss of givens greatly increases the cognitive dif difficulty of making that assessment, which would mean that we have to kind of rethink it uh, in different ways. But let me pass it to Mr. Javier Rivera. Mr. Rivera, I hope you are doing today, sir. You've been riding up a storm, Mr. Rivera. Very well done. I have, I have yeah, I guess <laughs> I guess I have. Um, yeah, this is a good question. Um, what you're bringing up, it's great. Um, let me put it this way. So, yeah, those are the problems right now, for sure. Um, like right now, I'm taking a religious and health diversity class. And a lot of those questions are centered on that. Like, how do you deal with Western biomedicine and the fact that there's religious difference or religious plurality? How do you deal with that? Um, and then it gets into a lot of conversations about the fact that... <laughs> Providers are astonished that they're not being objective, that they have their own beliefs. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they're 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 surprised that what they thought was just objective science comes with a sort of philosophy of death and life. And that becomes in conflict with what a religious person might perceive with their own philosophy of death and life. Um, it gets infinitely more complicated when we start talking about children. Because then it starts becoming a debate between how much does the child believe in what the parents are saying to believe um, and, and, and their own kind of assessment of that situation. So there's a, there's a lot going on about what we can and what we cannot do or what someone can or cannot do. Um, I think, I mean, I'm not entirely sure. But I think the conversation might might need to begin with something like we we should start getting people curious about being less afraid of other people's beliefs. That that might be that might be a start only because what I'm saying is I feel like a lot of the rhetoric is a kind of fear mongering about the other. Um, of course, there's real dangers. <laughs> there's real threats but i think a lot of those real threats are also manifested from the fear-mongering itself like it's a sort of contradiction in, in, in sorts right like it seems fair to also be afraid of the fact that there's like a, a kind of fundamentalism going on and and everything else um but a lot of that fundamentalism is also fed off of kind of a fear of, a, of overtaking right uh, even in a lot of religious conversation there is this this pushing forward of a secularization thesis, right? That the world's becoming more secular, so you need to be more vigilant and more defensive about Western values and everything else. Um, to some extent, I mean, it's 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 valid. Um, it's a, it's a valid concern, but to another extent, um, we we would have to really think about what we mean by secularism and how that. It's still debated as to whether secularism isn't already a form of religion itself. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, um, so I think at the end of the conversation, whether there is a discrepancy between secularism and religion, um, we have to talk about people's beliefs um, and and how groundless that can be when you are encountering another belief and and what that means. But I do think it might start with becoming more curious about other people's beliefs and how we can um, deal with that um, rather than accept or so on. Of course, there's another part about embracing a kind of pluralistic culture. The part, the problem with embracing a pluralistic culture is that it's usually someone's version of pluralism. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like even the idea of like a safe space is a, a to me, it's such a violence because it's kind of like saying like, um, this is safe so long as, like that's kind of the implicit part of a safe space, so long as. Um, 
But we also have to take seriously the fact that obstacles, conflicts, violence are ironically both the obstacles and the means towards some temporary resolution, right? So I always get a little bit hesitant when people are like, let's just be tolerant and avoid uh, conflict and violence. So there's always a, there's, to me, there's always a kind of violence in that itself, um, kind of ending the conversation. Um, so it's very complicated. Um, I, I totally agree. I mean, it's it's very hard, and and most people want to, um, but you can see what happens when we, when perhaps we don't get curious about what the other people believe, or or we play the safe part and just kind of um, play distance with each other. Um, I, I I think honestly, th this is my take. This is my take on this. I, I think we just need to have more interesting conversations with each other about our differences, <laughs> rather than saying what we should or should not do. I just think this is the beginning of it right here. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll stop. That's a lovely comment. I'll give it to Mister Jockin. Um, it definitely the idea of a safe space means you're being kept safe from someone. Ah, so who's that someone, and who defines the danger? I doubt the safe space is. Uh, trying to protect you from fresh air is probably who you define as the enemy, right? So there's always a kind of violence in that. I think also this idea on the question of are people doing what they can is an interesting structure because you could say, are people as ethical as they could be? Do they have as much agent as they could be? Are they as humble as they could be? It's almost like it's a X variable that you could put in a lot of things. And so that structure of measure, as it's like the question of measure in a way that Mr. Jockin was saying, it applies in all these different areas. So how do you judge measure in a, in a way, right? Because the, like you're saying with children, like the age of consent, is it, you know, it's, I guess for a lot of people, it's something like 12 or 13. And then as they're an adult at 18, there's a way in which you say, well, that seems arbitrary. Kids today seem like they're adults at 11 because of the exposure, right? So then we switch it. And it's like, no, yes. And it's, and it's interesting because it's like, you have to decide on something, but then it, but then it's violent. Like the decision has a violence to particularity and difference. So it's, it's a very deep question that has a lot of fraught problems. I think also what you're talking about ethics, I'm glad you brought that up. I'm increasingly more and more thinking that the other is the one who doesn't share your ethics. Like, it's one thing to talk about the other in terms of I'm white, they're black, but we're both Christian. Okay, they are other, but the one who's really other is the one who believes something is good that you think is evil. But right there, we're dealing with a problem because what if they believe slavery is good? What if they believe some form of oppression is good, right? So this is the weird thing I've been thinking about. I think the other like Derrida, Levin, all these people are talking about the other is the one who is ethically different, not merely in terms of preference or ways of talking. Those are like, those are on the gradient. But if you really get to the extreme case, that is the great, great, great problem is the problem of ethical difference. And then of course, there's some point in the ethical difference where now it's, mer now they're, now it's just unacceptable and we have to, uh, we have to stop it no matter what, right? Where is that? You know, where does that begin, right? Like, it's clear, for example, not to get into politics, it's very clear that in North Korea, there's unbelievably terrible things going on. But the world has decided, for whatever reason, that does not warrant an invasion. Is it because they're scared? Is it because they don't care? You know, why? Why not? We'd have to be there. But there's a, there's a way in which some things seem um, tolerable for whatever reason. Maybe that's just the um, invisibility of distance, the invisibility of not seeing images so people don't seem to care. Um, versus if you see images of events happening in Russia or, or the Middle East, that's what you're really concerned about, right? Are you saying that why is um, what's happening in the Middle East or Russia different than North Korea or what's happening to the Uyghurs uh, in parts of China, right, in northern China? That even reporting on you won't have because then so much of Chinese media or Chinese companies are investing in your media and you don't want to lose that money and so on and so forth, right? So, you know, the, the, it seems as if the question of what is fitting and what is acceptable, the other that we will care about is relative to some sort of measure of other variables, maybe variables of money, maybe variables of, well, we really can't make a difference with North Korea. China would have to do that. If America got involved, it would start World War III. There are other variables, but the point is the following. The other is always calculated. There's the other we care about and the other we don't care about. 
And yet, just because you don't care about that other, that may not automatically make it immoral, because what if you can't do anything about it? And in fact, doing something would make it worse. Like maybe with North Korea, that would start World War III with China, lead to all sorts of crises, and then you have a nuclear war or something, right? So the, this is what's interesting, because I think this question brings out, dare I say, the experience of particular topics, dare I see the having to really look at the details of particular cases, but then, of course, I think what you're getting at, and then I'll pass it to Mr. Jocka, and I know I've said a lot, but it's, it's the idea then, okay, well, given that, given this weird conundrum of the other being the one who we ethically disagree with, with by definition, if we ethically disagree with them, we shouldn't talk with them, right? And yet it seems to be the act of talking that is really, really important here. Right. That seems to be a kind of act of communicative rationality, as Habermas would talk about, that we have to take um, very, very seriously. And so I, I really like because it makes me think of Habermas. It makes me think, ah, oh, the man, oh, how are we doing, my dear friend? It is good to see you. But uh, but I really like what you were saying. And it does almost seem like this kind of question of the conversation itself about it has a kind of mediating function to help you work through and make the judgment or the assessment that you simply can't make from general information. But let me give it to Mr. Jockin. Mr. Jockin. I think you're making a great point, Daniel and Javier, about the nature of the other. I'm reminded from Aristotle, there is a, he has a distinction between difference and other. Difference is basically things that are, they're in some, they're in some continuum with each other, right? There's some ability to transcribe that you can move from hot to cold, for example, right? They're different from each other. They're not other in the sense that you can move from hot to cold. Other is basically going from hot to sharp. Like it's a completely different category. It does you cannot cross that category line. Um, what I'm hearing here is this idea of there is a moral reality that we do treat people's ideas and beliefs as a part of a moral object that we have to parse through. And the doctrine of tolerance, the rhetoric of tolerance, is to make an argument that even despite these supposed differences, there's something or an agreement that holds. Um, this is you can see different strategies of this. For example, we say Judeo Christian. Okay, we all know oh, that's an invention, right? Like the rhetoric about that, because there used to be a very systematic persecution of Jews by Christians, for example. Um, even Christians themselves, for example, when Catholics came to the United States, they were they suffered great persecution as Catholics because they weren't Protestant, for example, um, et cetera, et cetera. So. This mode of clearly at the point is like which degree of lens of the sudden switch from a difference to an other has significant outcome, significant consequences uh, by that. And I think the short answer is in terms of like, what's the answer today? I mean, here's a hot take. It's probably capital. Like that's the abiding agreement is that we use the same currency. We can exchange with each other. That's not that radically new. I mean, ancient Rome had that basic, basic argument. Uh, but that tends, if I would say, what is the common denominator that allows us to cooperate with each other? It's probably capital and the operations of capital. So jobs, for example. I say this because when was the last time we had a political speech that wasn't related to some job creation? Like, God help, like, you know, a JFK level. We're going to the moon, right? Where ask, ask not what you can do, what your country can do for you, what you can do for your country. Like, these kind of rhetoric, these, these are all rhetoric moves, by the way. I'm pointing that out. But nevertheless, the absence of the sign <laughs> to now to just kind of wave handing, I'm almost like on the Vesper gases of uh, of moment of historical pe precedence. Um, that stands out to me as something very standing. For, for that, that kind of waffleness of statement versus the concreteness of job job creation and that's like the an infrastructure building. These are the things that matter. It's fascinating, which is it's fun because that seems to be all dictums by economists. Economists tell you what the value is. Then. It's fascinating. Uh, and we've, we've, we've had discussions here where in reality, the economist's the judgment of value is actually from something outside economy in the first place. So it's like, what is this? Um, but that's just like the macro. Point. But I, I want to push back a little bit on this idea of the individual, like this kind of mental health, individual assessment, tension, resentment dynamic, because it's a big problem. We talked about this before, like the idea, even the example of like the judgment of a man, like who is he as a man? His bequeathing value ultimately was his name, which is a thing that got carried on into the future, right? So it's not even about him, it's about the name he carried into the future. Uh, 
that other people would take on his name. I mean, even the argument here, again, very old school, the idea of a man is the head of a house and his wife marries and takes his name of his what? Of his, of her husband. These are all modes that we, quite frankly, are incredibly old, old school slash almost, uh, like basically grotesque from a modernist point of view, from an individualist point of view. It's like, what do you mean you take, you would take his name? What is that? What are you saying about you? What's wrong with you? You know, um, so there's like a big tension point here. So I don't want to run away from going to abstractional points, which are, again, valid points are being made. But I want to just get back to something I'm, I'm fully acknowledging. There is big problems here. Because even the point here, I will say, probably the one that I can tell you that like, what is the distinctional mark of an individual that's outside your category as man or station, or whatever, it's probably your beliefs, your phantasms in your head. And, it's, and actually, that's actually very damning because it's almost all the time. That means there's a difference. You... Your degree of mental illness is defined by how much your phantasms in your head are misaligned to reality on the outside when there's a misalignment. And by the way, that can happen just as simple as just nostalgia is an example of it. Nostalgia is a kind of phantasm, right? You're getting a simulation of a current event, which is really just recalling in your mind something from 10 years ago or whatever. Obviously, nothing related to the actual stimulus in front of you, right? Nostalgia is an example of it. Um, Trauma responses absolutely are patterns. So if you have any kind of trauma response from a stimulus, it's not from the stimulus itself. It's from the pattern that you have in your head. So ultimately, when I say this, I'm kind of saying it's like a mode of difference, basically. It's like a privation. Like human being, it's, we, we talked about this before in our call, Daniel, right? That uh, part of the reason why God is the most personal, the most actual personal, is because all of us individual persons are actually incredibly lacking. We're like this lacking difference. And one of the ways we measure it is by this, basically how much our phantasms fail, either by hubris, by going over, or by basically fault, by falsity, by being mock modest. We, we think too lightly of ourselves and we can sin. We think too great of our accomplishments, right? And we diminish other people's accomplishments, uh, for example. Like I'm just painting examples of this. Again, I don't have an answer, but this is kind of like the best response I got from this. Uh, and one last note, just to close, is... This idea of the safe space, right, being a predication of violence, right? Like, is it it's saving you from something? I think that, that term violence, it's a really important term, right? It means a kind of, meta, it, it does predicate a kind of metaphysical reality that substances and things are being, a, being affected in a way that's not natural. That's what violence means from a metaphysics point of view. There's a lot, in, there, there's a lot that when you use that word, you're importing a lot of impositions as a result. Uh, which is really interesting because, for example, I mean, here's, I would just paint this case. Uh, obviously, in normal circumstances, someone striking you on the street is violence, right? That's a, un, that'd be a violent act. But then you got two boxers. That's not violence. That's a contest. That's the contest, right? That's a, that's a conflict. So conflict is perfectly, we say it's natural and good and true. I mean, and a lot of books and negotiations say this, that ultimately, a lot of times the truth will come revealed from conflict and then the resolution of conflict when done well, obviously. Uh, so I'm just meditating and chewing on that. that we're, using, we're using very powerful words with some serious implications. But then when we actually work through that, especially on this dynamic of the individual person to substance and essence, it's like, there's a chasm here that I don't have an answer to. Excellent. I'll pass it to Philip and Javier. And, you know, I'm glad you brought up capital because on Javier's question on has there ever been secularization, I think what is often called secularization is actually everything being put in the logic of capital. And we call that secularization, meaning we've all kind of moved beyond religious beliefs and we're kind of secular. But no, really, we are all kind of globally sharing the logic of capital. Uh, and here's the issue. Um, you know, there's an argument today that capital... Um, science, they're all reductionistic, right? That they kind of reduce human beings. Yes, they do. But the issue is that human beings have proven to really, really struggle when they have to interact with one another fully, non-reduced, right? Like if I'm meeting someone I've never met before and I don't have any idea and they're ethically, they believe things I think are crazy or whatever, at least if we share business, I can talk with them. Or at least if we can agree upon facts, I can talk with them. So it functions to be mediating. The problem is what ended up happening is we didn't really, in, in my opinion, with that 
Um, because I, I was going to say to Javier, like the idea that secularization was this, yeah, institutions in a way tried to become non-religious, but you see the issue is they misunderstood was what religion is. You can't not, you always have to be meta making metaphysical claims, right? Like the idea of separation in church and state, that's separation of faith and state. You can't separate, like the separation of church and state does not mean separation of faith and state. Like it is impossible for people to vote against what they believe, right? The question is, should there be an official state church? Something like that. But then, of course, the issue is based on the particular things of what the state does, they may be infringing upon people's religious beliefs. And that's where and then how do you measure that? At what point does that occur? And that's why for the last 30 years in the United States of America, it's basically been a war over the Supreme Court, which is a different topic and gets us into the textualist versus the living constitution. But that's actually really, really kind of um, vivid here. But I think basically what has happened is now we're facing the unintended consequences of reductionism. And we're saying, well, we need to get away from that. We need to escape the logic of capital because that removes, say, leisure. It makes us unable to um, deal with difference and we go, well, we need to move beyond science. But the issue is if we're going to do that, you could just go back to the religious wars. <laughs> you could just go back to everyone going crazy, right? So you have to put something positive if you're going to move away from that. What is the positive thing you put that? Javier was saying about the conversations. I do think it's just a note. There is something about these kind of conversations that actually get you used to hearing things like different language games, different emotions, different takes that makes it easier to encounter difference without the knee jerk. Because I think a lot of when you're in community or you're trying, you know, you're working with people in your practical life, a lot of the question is if you can avoid the knee jerk, the like knee jerk reaction or the out like outlash. But it's almost like something that philosophical discussion to do is can get you used to that and kind of this is almost in a way, a, I don't want to say a safe space, but a experimental space, a space where you can experiment with hearing difference or is there things you're like, oh, eh, I don't know. Oh, OK, well, actually, I see where they're coming. I see what they mean. But you get used to that. And that actually, I think, is a really important kind of emotional training to encounter difference in the way that we're describing. I think a philosophy does more than that. But I also think there's actually this is an example where if there's something about the capacity to encounter the other and not have a knee jerk in a way that that's actually something that philosophical discussion might be able to help with simply in getting used to hearing so many differences about so many deep, really important questions, right? There's more to be said, but let me pass it to Philip, Javier, and then Michelle and Dimitri. It is good to see you, sir. It is a pleasure. So let me give it to Philip. Philip. Maybe we play with language a little bit and, and, and keep uh, to keep that knee jerk at bay. You know, you, you turn it into a sacred space and there's something you say I really like about the not yet. It's like my knee wants to jerk, but like not yet. It wants to have that as soon as the doctor hits whatever, the cap, it has the reflex. But we, we have an ability to uh, have some interference. And yeah, I'm really interested because a lot of a lot of what what you were saying, Jock, and uh, a lot of the disagreements to me seem on the level of what is reality and like not knowing that reality is a culturally sanctioned and linguistically enforced hallucination uh can be like a you know cause to get the nuclear codes out you know because it's like no i got i got access so then you get into look on about uh accessing the real and and all his different registers i wonder how often our sense of reality is overlain by the vocabulary available to us. And if we are, um, like Shakespeare was a wordsmith, he added to the dictionary. And did that somehow uh, <laughs> uh, change people's ability of what they thought they can do? You know, that was a time when um, the printing press was kind of... Uh, changing people's ideas of, of what is possible. And um, yeah, I sometimes wonder if it wouldn't be a good use of our time and energy to keep experimenting with, uh, if not new signifiers, at least new associations with signifiers. And that's that's kind of what the philosophical endeavor feels like to me sometimes. So. 
That's a lovely comment. I'll give it to Javier and Michelle. And I definitely think there's something about philosophy as play, something more playful about philosophy to move around and not to hold anything too tightly. That is really important for this kind of, we're all stuck in maps that aren't the territory, and yet we require maps of some kind. Uh, because there is this question like, you know, the open, but that seems to have a different quality than a philosophy of let's memorize a system. And if we hold to the system and use all of the language really precisely all the time, then we'll be saved. Because that's almost like uh, a Christianity where you're saved by works versus faith. It's like, I got to get it all. So there's a kind of playful, creative, artistic endeavor that seems a little different. Um, and then Mr. Kashir, good to see you. But there's definitely this question of what is reality. You know, the opening essay, The Conflict of Mind is truth organizes values. What you believe is true organizes what you value, you think is good, bad, beautiful, ugly, and so on and so forth. And there does seem to be a danger if you say, well, there is no truth. Well, then there's no way to organize values and it's chaos. You know, if it's all, if it's hallucination all the way down with no ability to determine anything, which is where for me Hegel's so interesting because the movement of thought itself becomes like the real so that you're trying to kind of home in on. That's good. But then there's another thing that seems to be problematic if you say your hallucination is the objective. Well, that's oppressive, right? That's trying to create a given. So there's a real problem here that I think has to be taken seriously and is is the real instead of some sort of like, is the real this exchange itself, the relation itself? I mean, that's a move that everyone online is moving, right? Like the liminal web, ontology of relation. How we were talking about the conversation itself. Is it something about the unfolding of the conversation? That is what you want to locate your ethics on. Because if you don't locate your ethics in something unfolding, it seems overly static. But then if it's located on just pure hallucination, then it seems... Like everyone's just going to atomize, right? Because how do you even begin to engage? So I think it's a very deep question you're bringing up. But let me pass it to Javier and then Michelle. Javier Rivera. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a there's a responsibility that needs to recognize, and I think that's to me that's where how. Um, I, I really like focusing because it's very similar to. Um, what I like when I read Adam Phillips, for example, I mean, he comes from the psychoanalytic tradition himself. What I really like about what Adam Phillips says, and it's just like a quote line he says about psychoanalytic theory, he's like, we don't need theory, we just need better sentences. Um, and I really like, <laughs> I really like the part where ethics, if we start with ethics in terms of we just need better sentences, better sentences to keep us from what Philip was calling the knee-jerk reaction. <laughs> right because i think the one sentence that we don't want to hear when we have a real ethical difference with the other is um i know what i'm talking about <laughs> you're wrong <laughs> that's really the knee-jerk reaction that we're trying to prevent at the time um and and that can feel so um, um like the, there is no conversation anymore really um so yeah, I mean, I think I think the first thing would be admitting, like Jockin kind of admitted, we don't really have answers. And I think the first part would be beginning with that kind of idea that we can't come in preemptively with our answers, but we can come in preemptively with our good sentences <laughs> about what we think about what we think could be a better life, or we could come in thinking about what people might like about living this possible life. Right. I think the problem with ethical conversations is we really start to lack imagination because it starts to become a real difference between my ethical difference and yours. But what if we stripped that away? What if we made it more open and more curious and start entertaining a life together and what that would be like? And that really forces a lot of imagination and what that would be like versus coming in with each other saying, no, I, I know exactly how life would be like. So I do agree with um, Philip here that it is really a kind of debate about what reality is. The problem is, and this is the significance of Hegel, because I just finished Robert Pippin's take on self-consciousness of Hegel, and I just started um, Molly Parnas' take on Hegel's social ethics. What's really significant about the conversation is that self-consciousness really desires another acknowledgement of the self-consciousness. <laughs> There's a reason why we are extremely unsatisfied if one person gives a picture of reality that is denying our own in some sense. 
or is denying our own take in that participation of reality. Um, so there's a, there's a lot to be said there. Um, but yeah, I, I do think it, it's, it, it definitely has to do with a lot of conversation and, and trying to imagine what a life would be like living together with this plurality without, re without already being tempted to give a normative prescription about what that is. And I think terms like safe spaces and everything else, th those are already trying to dictate a prescription of how to live in a pluralistic world. While, I, while ironically denying the antagonism that would say no. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it to me, it would be more like, to even stick with the Hegelian paradigm a little bit, it would be, how do we live with the antagonism versus trying to get rid of it? And I think that's always the knee-jerk reaction. How do I get rid of the antagonism? Um, and of course, it's always contextual, right? There's real dangerous antagonisms that we probably want to avoid. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I'll, I'll leave it there. Delightful. I'll pass it to Michelle and then Christian. And it's very interesting because I'm thinking now on this idea of interacting with a person, not imposing a norm. But then I also think about the fact that at work, unloading the trucks um, was not a hallucination. Like there was a particular task that had to be done to make the truck work. Like the pipes at the venue, they have to be fixed. I wonder if the issue is the relation of difference without a shared task, where what you can then share that you can agree upon is not a norm that is given or imposed, but found in facticity. That the interpretation of it, it's not like I'm asking you, what is a truck? I like that would be kind of ontology and get into kind of difference, but it's like, how do we do this kind of action? So maybe part of the problem with like global pluralism is the fact that because of the screen and the internet, you find yourself interacting with difference, but not the ability to share a task by which to kind of mediate the difference. Because the other thing is there are lots of people at work who I'm very different from, but the reorbiting of the task allows the gradual process of getting used to their difference to work on that um, knee jerk so that you don't have that knee jerk. And I'm also thinking about ph how philosophy is kind of a regularity of a task that also helps you work on getting used to that difference. So it's almost like there might be a question here about encountering difference too directly versus d difference indirectly, because then there also seems to be a danger in saying that you can, like, it's weird because if you say, oh, well, you can actually get better, like, oh no, we can, we can overcome the problem. That seems problematic. But it also seems problematic to say that there's no way to get better at all. It's almost like you get better at never being able to finish the issue. Like you never finish with work, but you get better at doing this thing that you can never finish, maybe. There's some way to language this and I'm thinking about because the, the encounter of difference is always a surprise as a deep difference. And that never goes away. And in fact, if it goes away, you may lose the opportunity at getting better at encountering difference, right? But it seems like there are ways of perhaps not having the same knee jerk, even though you never overcome entirely the other or that in this deep sense, or that would mean that you've isolated yourself. So there's something interesting here at getting better at something you can never finish maybe, which then in one sense means you're never getting better, but then in your own particular experience, you experience as an improvement. But then, of course, in order to improve, the next thing you would encounter would have to be harder than the last, which would make it seem as if you haven't improved because it has a similar relative difficulty. So there's something very interesting here that makes me think of the Dante with the glasses being filled. More has to be said on that, but let me pass it to Michelle and Christian. Michelle. Yeah, this is all so, so great. I really appreciate it. Um, and what, what it got me thinking about was um just how i think the risk of of um like the safe space is that it's almost a bit too kumbaya like let's all you know just sit around and sort of uh it's it's like i think there there's there's something that's too idealistic about that you know like um i mean there's other problematic dimensions to the safe space because every everything's safe except if you're going to show any form of what could be interpreted as could be interpreted as intolerance right uh, so it's it's sort of like how, where are the limits? Who decides the limits of that extension of safety, or what's allowed or not allowed? Um, it's it's tricky, and it's but it seems so self evident. It's just self evident. It's just a safe space. Like, but what does that really mean? Like, what does that really mean? Um, but also, again, I think there's like the idealistic version of of you know 
kumbaya, like we'll all just get along, everything's okay, you know, there's like that. But there is, but I think what is missed with that is the cultivation of the skill for the conversation. Because it's it's okay, like it will work in your head. It's great about difference. It'll work in your head wonderfully. Um, to have that sort of kumbaya, we'll all come together, we'll like this sort of sense. Um, I don't I don't know, I just like saying the word kumbaya, I guess. But I think that what really needs to be cultivated is actually how to converse with people how to because I think when the ethical difference comes up once it comes up like somehow unexpectedly suddenly the person says oh I'm I'm this or I don't do that or I believe in this it's kind of it's kind of too late to talk about that anymore in my opinion it's, it's not the time in my opinion I don't think it's the time you just let it be like you just let it let the person say it yeah you know like it's I feel as though if if we kind of to the point that Javier was saying about like having more interesting conversations, if people were having more interesting conversations, they wouldn't be worried so much about the fact that they both have a different interpretation of what it means to have like, you know, medical care, like, or what should the government be doing with our medical care or something, you know, just, just pick something. Uh, and I, and I feel like when the difference shows itself, that's the place to sort of just let it be. Don't have the knee jerk reaction again to Javier's point about fear. People are so afraid and it's, 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 and it's scary. Cause you're like, whoa, what does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean? And then what does it mean about me? Like, what does it mean about what I believe? Mm, should I re-question everything? That's super existential. So I guess what I'm, I'm trying to say is that when those differences show, I, 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 I suppose I'm just thinking very practically of like how this, this goes, how this occurs. At least I'm just trying to think of my own life examples. I think it's best to just have that acknowledgement of, yeah, that people are different, right? Like there's a lot of different types of people in the world. Um, and that can kind of sound kumbaya-y, <laughs> but it's sort of just acknowledging a reality, right? But in terms of like, it, it seems like something you could only ever talk about indirectly. If, you, if you're wanting to sort of show or present something different, it may just have to be through your own actions and your own life. If somebody likes that, great. If they don't, great, you know? And I, I, but it is, it's a very tough place to live in that place of like, not just throwing it all away. Okay, well, everyone believes something different. So it's all relative. So I'm not going to have any stances on anything, right? Like that's a temptation. But I think we're, we, we have to learn how to cultivate what we, you know, what we feel compelled toward or what we feel, you know, gripped by while other people feel gripped by something else and be able to just hold that tension, like like we're saying, like hold that antagonism, not be too idealistic about it being kumbaya, where it's just like, we're just all like, you know, everybody's just happy-go-lucky. But how we can do that is to actually, again, like cultivate the conversations, share the spaces where we all have to eat. So let's cook together. I mean, that's like, those are the things that like you're saying with the shared task, Daniel, I definitely think that a hundred percent, that's why I love like nature so much and biology so much. Cause it's like, well, we all got bodies. We can start to question that with uh, transhumanism and stuff like that. That's why it's getting even more like, it's a particularly interesting topic when we think about um, the new but I mean, it's not, it's, it seems new, but it's not necessarily new. Like it's been going on forever, <laughs> the tension between like the body and technology and all of this stuff. But the point of the matter is, is that fundamentally, usually most people need to eat again, right? Most people need to use the bathroom at some point again. So most people need to sleep at some point again and wake up again. So there are these things that are so core to all of us. We can all relate on those very core levels. And because we're in like, I mean, I'm not suggesting we all go back to surviving and stuff. There's obviously like there's there's pros and cons to um just having a, a like a survival mode or like a thrival mode because thriving can sometimes make you not realize the value in some of the, the ontological things of survival like our core things our core needs or whatever but um i guess what i mean to say is that we we might like we we are so far removed from sort of like just the basic skills of gathering firewood how to cook the the non bread? I'm just making something up. You know, it's like when those things were more part of it. I mean, and I'm not saying this is a perfect example, but over the years in history, a lot of the time times when you had very different people groups who had very different beliefs, often they would be able to actually sustain relations over sharing food, over protecting each other. <laughs> you know, and so it's like I know that's so kind of 
it's so, oh, it's like back to survival and stuff, but it can be helpful for us to consider that. Um, but the other thing that really is just, just the cultivation, cultivation of conversation, being able to talk about more stuff than just what you are certain about, you know, like, let's just talk about, like, let's talk about like the, the things. And that, that's why I do find philosophy to be helpful because then you can go to that level of let's, that's interesting. Or why do you think that? Or that's, that's cool. That's cool. Or what's your, or listening to people's stories. I mean, that's not really like has to be seen as philosophical, just listening to what people's stories are, just being a good, trying to be a good listener. But anyways, I'm just, all that to say, there's idealistic kumbaya. I think what we could do is possibly have the sense of, yeah, hold space for that difference, but be willing to be different yourself and not hide yourself or just completely chameleon so that you, oh, I don't want to deal with that tension. I don't want to deal with that tension, right? But also learn how to have, like you're saying, Javier, like the good com the, the good conversations, the interesting conversations. I mean, I'll, I'll leave out the word good. The interesting conversations so that, th that it doesn't just happen, that everything that is being talked about are those kind of like hot topics or those like, but you know, pushing people's buttons sort of topics, which people seem to love to gravitate towards in small talk. You know, it's like, it's strange. Small talk ends up being very catastro catastrophic, even though it's small talk. It's like, no, it ends up being very big and sometimes drama filled. I find that like some of the the more, let's say, long winded conversations or the more like narrative, like listening to stories or listening to ideas, it seems like it's the big, but it actually realizes what's really small potatoes and what's what are mountains, you know? So anyways, that I just wanted to say all that. Thanks. No, that's delightful. And it makes me think I'll pass it to Christian and Demetri. And I need to get on that hammock there, Christian. That looks good. And this is lovely because we were talking, Christian and I were talking just a bit ago about this kind of tension of it's almost like you need something to warm up to the other. So if you're working in a community and you have a meal, it helps you warm up to the other where you have time to see them as a human being, where if you're too direct, it's too quick and you don't have time to humanize them. And so then it becomes a conflict, right? Where it's like this warming up that you could have on the task. And um, and it's almost like the problem is in global pluralism, everyone's online interacting, but there, there's something about the philosophical discussion. If at work you have a task, like unloading the truck, it's like the philosophical discussion is an art and there's a, com there's a connection between art and task, right? And both of them have a warming up function, right? Where you can kind of warm up and the problem is, if you're going to have global pluralism or difference without working at something together, just online commenting, then you really need that kind of long form philosophy or you need to talk about something to warm up or it's probably going to collapse into misunderstanding, memetics and all these different things. And I guess that's why when we were talking about Dante the other day on unveiling, you know, you all there, you need this unveiling process. But what's so interesting is you never there's there's a sense in which you can improve via warming up but you can never improve out of the need to warm up. Because I'm always taken by no matter how much you talk about knowing people are different, when you actually encounter difference, it's like restart. It's like, oh, yes, this is difficult. But then you can kind of be more aware that, wait, just because it's difficult, it is possible to warm up. So there's something very interesting here. And I think what you're saying about directness leads to trouble. And it's like thinking about it in a kind of warm up structure. And then, of course... This is incredibly important if we're going to move beyond the logic of capital or science to deal with beliefs and different things. These methods of warming up become really important because you're not just avoiding difference entirely through economics or, you know, just kind of pushing it off. There's more to be said, but let me give it to Master, Mr. Christian and then Dimitri. And Christian, it is good to see you today, sir. I hope you are doing well. It's a pleasure. Likewise, Daniel. Um... I don't have a lot of time to hang out. As I mentioned, I've got a lot of uh, grant application writing to do over the next 24 hours, but I've missed so many uh, <clears throat> the nets since meeting Daniel. I figured uh, this would be a great opportunity to procrastinate uh, from my grant writing uh, during my lunch break here. Um, and I will give uh, one, one disclaimer that I also gave to Daniel when I we first got in touch was that I'm a little bit of a philosophical idiot in terms of the, the academic sides of philosophy. So um, my, my, I'm kind of like an outsider philosopher or something like this. Um, but everything you guys are talking about is such a hugely, is, is very central to what I do on a daily basis in working with community organizing in a rural area, um, political advocacy, uh, project leadership, sustain, it, like, 
confronting the otherness of others is just it's part of the the whole game um so i thought i would just share a few snapshots from my life that that i think kind of illustrate the dynamics you guys are talking about um there's task oriented stuff so the other day i play soccer with some friends of mine once or twice a week and it's interesting um to observe uh, interpersonal dynamics on the soccer field uh and how different that is than off the soccer field uh you can do things you just normally wouldn't be able to do you can get mad at someone and yell at them like say what the fuck you can you can boast you can shit talk and do all sorts of interesting things uh, that you just never would do in a regular conversation with someone. Um, and, and there's a lot of forgiveness. And, and once you get off the soccer field, you kind of like you're not holding grudges. Very rarely do you have to apologize uh, for anything that's happened on the soccer field. Sometimes you do. Uh, but it, it, it's I also was noticing the other day because I got way too stoned before I played soccer. And so I was like, like being philosophical on the soccer field um in terms of like uh cultural pluralism and and just really like otherness you know i'm good friends with a lot of people on the soccer field there's some people i know a little bit some people i only know through soccer there's some people who show up you've never met them before and to me i was just observing how interesting it is that uh you've got these this group of people who don't in many ways don't know each other um, who knows what your your thoughts, your values, your politics are. And uh, yet we're all here doing stuff together. We're playing a game together. We're having fun together. Like if you think about it anthropologically, uh, how bizarre would that have been many thousands of years ago to all of a sudden be in a context with literally a bunch of other humans that you don't know involved in this very goofy task of putting a ball into a net um, and, and not being anxious about that? Not not having your deepest tribal uh, instincts be triggered, like, who, who, where am I? Who am I? Who are you? That's like a very interesting attribute of modern society. I mean, obviously, that shows up everywhere in your work environment. Um, but but there's something about the, the, the intimacy of sports, which uh, made that and maybe the marijuana as well, which made it very salient to me. <clears throat> um, and then, as I was mentioning to Daniel in our, our last conversation, I'm also part of a, a very task oriented community of homestead builders. And that's also another interesting experience because um, there's a, there are certainly, there's some kind of Venn diagram of our, our shared values in terms of um, what brought us together as off grid, sustainable home builders, alternative home builders in the first place. Uh, but otherwise, there's a lot of difference. There's a lot of cultural backgrounds that are different, religious backgrounds, political affiliations. Uh, and that has not yet been an issue ever. Um, and our group, we recently broke our record for most people at what we call a work party. We had 70 people um, at, a, at a build. And uh, our, our overall network is 100 some now, keeps growing. Uh, and it's it's wonderful. It's it's a relief to be a part of a community of people where um, you, you frankly don't even talk about politics very much unless it's a very good friend. Or if you do, you do so in a way where you tread very lightly and it's very respectful. Um, no, yeah, it, there's there's a, a very immediate kind of neighborly bond. There's a, a sense of respect and friendship, really. Uh, that transcends the, these other aspects of your identity and your personality, or I'd say identity more than personality. Um, and that that's, to me, yeah, that, I think that speaks to what you guys were saying about having something which bridges across divides, something which, which creates a, uh, a, a grounding rod, a foundation, which, which is, which is deeper than those aspects of, of your um, philosophy and identity, task oriented. And, and I guess that, you know, it's such a revelation to me, but how often do you find that in the city, in an urban area, outside of your job, I suppose? Um, and, and certainly outside of uh, anything that's economically driven, um, as you were saying, Daniel. 
uh, we, we, what we do, we don't get any money from this. I mean, I guess we, time and energy is is at play, of course. Um, but certainly, we're not trying to uh, make the number go up in our bank account. Um, that I, I'll we had a great experience at that last work party where whoever we're helping, they host us for lunch as well. And uh, the the mom was calling us all in for lunch, and our our volunteer foreman was obstinate that we work for 30 more minutes and everyone else agreed and we and there's we must keep work you know just this all this energy that that's purely motivated by the joy of of helping our, our neighbors and, and completing a task um anyway so that that's been beautiful and i think it's it sets a foundation for new paradigms of of community and culture um although of course it's a very small scale uh in the the world of politics, man, you know, that's where I find myself having to do a lot of heavy lifting. Um, I do greater community organizing with really diverse stakeholders around groundwater issues. I helped form a, a water alliance with city and county officials and farmers and ranchers. And you better believe people were bringing all sorts of different interests and biases and beliefs into these conversations. And a lot of times, you know, if, if not for this person or that person acting as a mediating agent, you wouldn't have been able to have an effective, productive, respectful conversation. Um, and I think that's that's in some situations always going to be the case where you simply can't expect that um, people are going to be the very best version of themselves and, and be equipped to navigate their fears and uh, navigate their 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 beliefs or possibly delusional beliefs about things. And it's helpful to have someone who is equipped, is, is particularly skilled in facilitating conversation in, you know, spotting, uh Oh, I see a tension rising here. What can I do to bring that tension back down? Um, and so, you know, when we talk about how do we, how do we build bridges to the others and, and all of that, it, there's, I think there's a lot of, different solutions that are relevant to different contexts. And sometimes I think you need specialized uh, assistance in those regards, facil real facilitation. Um, and, and that'll bring me to maybe the last thing I'll mention, which is uh, I'm recently doing a, what are they calling it? A workshop with uh, Forrest Landry's EGP um, inquiry coaching, which is run by uh, um, some, it, it's being, managed by some friends of mine, Bevan, uh, Ben Lovenheim and, and uh, Evan Chen and, and some others. And that's been fun. It, it, and it's, it's an interesting approach too, in terms of like, you know, the, the question of very like regulated conversational contexts, you know, w w is there a role for that? Is there a role for um, curated spaces, which, help to encourage effective conversation. Uh, and, and I think that there, there can be for certain. Um, again, having facilitation can help, just having an agent there who helps to manage. Uh, but also, you know, I, I, I think I agree with some of the comments that trying to regulate the, the, the semantics of a conversation is very difficult and probably in most cases, not very helpful. Um, but you can uh, regulate the modality of a conversation. And that's one thing that they explore in the EGP process. Um, and I mean, there's a lot to facilitated small group conversation, but one of the, the like kind of unique things about the process is this focus on the generation of questions as, as a process, right? Rather than the generation of propositions, right? And so Again, facilitation is, is key here because most people aren't used to, to that kind of conversational modality. Uh, but on the whole, when everyone has agreed to that modality, they're, they're, they're going to more likely abide by it and, um, and play into it. And so then, you, you know, when you're sitting around with a group of people and the objective is not to come away with an answer to a question or, or a, a strategy or an opinion, but rather to literally just expand the space of inquiry by generating more questions. 
I mean, that I think can just in, in a purely mechanical way help to avoid a lot of the common pitfalls that happen when you have uh, diverse stakeholders, diverse opinions coming into conversation with each other. Um, so that's a lot. I just all this came up as you guys were talking. And uh, it's yeah, there's it's a real, real important, uh, juicy topic, in, in my opinion. And I'll stick around for a little bit, but I'll be hopping off soon. And thanks, Daniel, so much for hosting this. And good to meet everybody. Outstanding, Chris. I'll pass it to me. I hope you have more things you need to procrastinate uh, because that was wonderful. I really appreciate everything that you were saying. Um, It's very weird because at the end, what you were saying, isn't it strange that it seems like that once you stop trying to make progress, you make progress. Once you stop trying to find an answer and do questions, then it almost feels like you approach something. There's something very weird about the human being that it's in this, well, let's not try to get at the goal that then actually makes the goal kind of feel like it's manifesting. But then the moment you look at it, it kind of disappears. Just like uh, Peter looking at the water and sinking or Lot seeing his wife. There's some weird thing here that's a place. What's also very weird is it feels like you can become most intimate with people through a game, through something arbitrary. Like as you were speaking, something that came to mind is the safe space as the field of battle. Like it's on the battlefield that it's actually a safe space because you can yell at your friend, you can tell them they're an idiot, you can punch them in the face and it's not personal. Isn't it weird how there's almost a safe space in the field of battle? And the problem is that what a lot of people call a safe space is trying to create safety outside of battle. And so then it's not even safe. It's actually exclusive, right? So And there's something also strange where it's almost like in philosophy, like a conversation like this, it is a kind of quote unquote game. Like everyone, there's a kind of game. It's like soccer, there's kind of a game. And so you can disagree, you can talk, you can go. And it creates a certain, oh, we know everyone. And there's a feeling of something very real. And yet it also, at the end of the day, you can always go, well, it was just soccer. Well, it was just philosophy. And yet it's weird because some of the things that you feel that you develop the most intimacy in are these kind of, artif I wanna say artificial constructs but then, like, artificial seems too strong of a word because on the battlefield, the wrestling mat, yeah, it's just a sport, but actually the connections that are established or the ways that um, transform you are very tangible and very, very weird, very real. And, and I also just think about, too, how you're mentioning the different dynamic in politics. It's almost like when you go into politics, it's hard to forget that it is seemingly arbitrary and stupid. And the whole time you're like, why do we have to do this? It's so dumb. Why do we even have to pass laws? Where on the on the soccer field, you can almost forget it's a sport. Like you almost like you get lost in it. And it's almost like the problem with politics is you never get lost in it. And so you always realize it's kind of a artificial structure. Yeah, it's necessary, but it's it's stupid. I don't like it. Whereas when you go on the soccer field, it's almost like you forget it. And likewise, in a, like a philosophical dialogue, you can kind of forget that, oh, wait, at the end of the day, we have to go back to work. There's a kind of forgetting there. And in that very kind of flow or self-forgetfulness, you find you feel improved in a way. And yet that improvement is in the context of something that's kind of like a game, which is very odd. Because like Philip at the beginning was saying this idea that, you know, doesn't it come down to a question of reality? And it's like, well, maybe we can't even access reality and we can never get better at getting closer at reality. And even if we do, we can't know it. It's like, yeah, it's almost like, well, because that's the case, what we have to do is create games relative to which we can get better at. And that's kind of the arbitrary thing. And then though, because we actually don't know if the game has something to do with deepest reality, there's always a kind of open hand of that possibility. Uh, because if you said it didn't, then you would have to know reality to say that the game, quote unquote, didn't have something to do with it. And that there's some sort of faith in the participation of that possibility based on the quality changes in the relations that are there in the sport, on the soccer field, in the philosophy, the changing of the quality of the conversation or the relating then functions as the possibility. Yeah, Wittgenstein, I would say like the language game. It's almost like you can expand that uh, kind of broadly, but it, but it's hard to use the word game because that feels kind of arbitrary. But I am taking how like kids seem to be okay with difference as long as they're playing tag, right? Like it feels like, boom, they just kind of lost in it. But then it's like, it's kind of weird because it's like, well, does that mean people get closer to one another via delusion, via something arbitrary? And it's interesting how all of those kind of questions come up.
But then to you, I mean, the, mo the moment you use that language, you almost have to say that you know what reality is, right? In order to say that this isn't part of something deeper or not. So it's just very interesting because the thing that came to mind, um, and then I'll give it to Dimitri here, is how the field of battle actually is a safe space. Like there actually is something about the field of battle or trial or gymnasium that creates a kind of safety to work with people. Whereas if you skip that and tried to create a safe space outside the quote unquote field of battle, then it actually just makes people nervous. There's a kind of fragility because I guess it's there's a difference between the safety of avoiding challenge and the safety in always being able to handle challenge, which actually makes me think of the difference. Um, what was the word you used? on of like putting your head down and running through fear versus courage. What was that word, Christian, that you used in the conversation? What was that? Yeah, antiphobia. Oh, I love it. Oh, I love it. So there's a difference between antiphobia and, uh, and uh, courage. Like just kind of like running through fear and not facing it versus facing it. I think that's also part of it. But let me give it to Dimitri and then Mr. Jockin. And good to see you here, Christian. So Dimitri, good to see you, sir. It's very dark here on the streets. But I like the hoodie look. Uh, it's really cool. It's like a really good aesthetic there. Okay. Then I will keep it. Oh, no, it's good. It was all a brightness thing. Um, first, I want to say this to the Sulphur Springs Valley. Like, first of all, shout out to Sulphur Springs Valley. <laughs> I don't know what that is, but it's the, the, I guess the guy works there pretty cool. And he's not an idiot. You know, he should look at the etymology of the word idiot because... The word idiot uh, comes from Greek, idios, and it, this means private, you know? So it's the opposite of encountering otherness. You're an idiot if you're the one evading that otherness all the time. And to this extent, we could uh, be justified in accusing a lot of um, professional academic philosophers of being absolute idiots. Uh, I don't have a problem with that. Now, on the topic of the game, Daniel G just said it was arbitrary. I don't, yeah, I don't think so, man. I have to I have to disagree so much here. To me, it's all a big game. Like life is a game, philosophy is a game, like rap is a game, like you know, sports is a game, like you know, dating, it's all a game. <laughs> it's all a big game. <laughs> and I actually I was trying to to hone in on this. Oh, there's a car passing. I hope you Okay, that was a very loud car. They like to flunk with it sometimes. Um yeah. So, uh, but no, I actually, I went to go to uh, to Hegel and Nietzsche and a big, I tried to emphasize this in one of the papers I wrote that one very important thing to me is that Hegel and Nietzsche utterly agree that life is a game. Like for Hegel, Hegel literally says the absolute idea or the concept, whatever you want to call it, it's a game. It's a game of what? It's a game of distinguishing itself from itself and then taking it back up into itself and also like differentiating itself from itself and like this this is the game it's like ping pong it's like tennis you know in the in a sense but it's even more if it's it's even more awesome and now today i will announce my favorite dutch word of the month which is kwebben nobody uses this word which is very unfortunate it says a lot about our culture contemporary culture in the netherlands uh, I hope we will be able to bring this back someday because this is uh, like we have in Germanic languages that are not English. English is not a Germanic language. I take that stance. If you disagree with me, um, you are allowed. But <laughs> yeah, I, I'm so certain I'm right. So anyway, back to back to the to, to the Netherlands. Is, we have a speculative word. We've all heard about Aufhebung. We're tired of it now. We we we, we want another speculative word with three meanings to say Hegelian. Kwebben. This is how you pronounce it. Kwebben. What does it mean? Kwebben. One thing it means is to greet someone, you know, say hello. And another thing is to uh, go talk to someone, you know, to say hello, how are you? And then you start a conversation. But there, the third meaning is, is the best one, where actually it ties it all together. And it's relevant to the conversation, which is even more epic. It's to attack someone. So to greet someone and to go talk to someone is also to attack someone. And you might think, hey, maybe that's uh, very weird. But, you know, the other day I was getting some cigarettes at uh, this, this tobacco place. And there's a Persian guy working there. And uh, he started talking to me. So I started talking back to him. And then he started, like, we started going back and forth. And it was very strange because immediately we kind of, like, started jokingly attacking each other. You know, he was joking about how young I look. And then we were talking about, like, 
just stupid bullshit. The fact that, you, that I was joking about the fact that he didn't have a girlfriend because he said he didn't have like stuff like this. You know, we like I didn't even know this guy. We were just like, but I I always love making small talk. And sometimes you know people do feel attacked. Like I remember the other day just talking to a guy joking around, and he was like. He was not into it, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, I love this word, Kweben. It's so correct. It's so correct. Because like even coming, after, you know, after that conversation, I was walking away and I was feeling like, damn, it's like, on the one hand, it was a very nice conversation and we left. But on the other hand, I did feel attacked, you know, when he was like joking about um, about me. But there is this thing that, yeah, he, you have to, you have to, you have to do two things here. You know, maybe this is where where philosophy can be. What philosophy can be good at? It can help you to uh, be right, or like not be right, but to cor- to attack someone correctly, and also to be attacked correctly. Because you know, if he would like go over my boundaries and I don't know, start talking about my mother, that I wouldn't have liked that. You know, I would not have appreciated that. But so that's like a wrong attack. But you know, if he says something jokingly and I can say it back and he's not offended, you know, you have to be able to not get offended, but also you have to be able to offend and you like you because that's where the game starts. And this game is also called, uh, called friendship, you know. <laughs> I love making like fun of my friends, like it's you're so ridiculous and they make fun of you and you're like, ah, I don't know what to say back and now they kind of won, you know, and it's frustrating. Like this is the, the yeah, I love this kind of stuff. So Great, uh, great conversation. Oh, one, one more thing, Javier. What you said, man. I, I felt that so deeply in my, in my bones. This thing that uh, sometimes in a, a world view or something like this, a narrative, whatever we want to call it, it does not address you. It does not take into account your existence. And um, yeah, it's like a lot of times you see this with. Yeah, with, with people who who have had like certain uh, chances and like get certain kind of privileges and they don't know what it is to not have it or they don't even know what it is to have it. And then they talk about it in a way that does not take into account the fact that not everyone has lived a life uh, like them, you know? And I really, uh, yeah, this is where my blood <laughs> can start uh, cooking. Fantastic to me. I love the idea that greeting is also an attack. That's grand. Um, second, I love uh, Christian is the anti-idiot. That's fantastic in the sense of an isolated individual. That's really good. And a lot of academics are idiots. No, I mean, for me, what I think all this unveils is the idea that words like arbitrary or hallucination or stuff like that seem to not work. And it's like, also, it seems to be like often if we say a game is arbitrary in the sense of that we can't ground it in reality, it could be the case that the most authoritative or meaningful things in reality are actually arbitrary. Where often we think arbitrary means they don't matter, but arbitrary could actually mean a partial object that is this based on like what Jochen and I were saying last week at the at the conversation. Like arbitrary could mean it is a partial object and therefore it is a primary substance. It is definitive versus the definition and therefore it is an invitation to perpetually play. And what is also interesting is like if the dance, if the Trinity is a dance, like there's a sense in which highest reality is play, actually. And this is where I think the problem is because like because because it's like if god trinity dance bliss it's almost like highest reality is play but we associate play with almost being silly or arbitrary or not serious and then therefore we miss this kind of kind of paying attention to the fact that intimacy seems to come out on the field of battle in philosophical discussion in games and we say oh we don't really notice that or take that as philosophically substantive because we dismiss them as kind of games, or we don't really look at unfolding or indirectness as revelations of the proper philosophical method because we're so kind of biased to think of directness or algebra or like a direct syllogism as the way. Um, and I think this is all important because then, and then I'll give it to 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 uh, Mr. Jockin, um as we come up on the close because we will have to go in like 20 or so minutes. Also, I wanted to say what you were saying on friendship. It's, I think friendship at its best is, a, is like a sport or like a field of battle. You can give your friends a hard time. You can tackle them. That's precisely why they're friends. Like the quality that you look for in a relationship is the safety of the battle. Like the fact that the battle is safe. Like you are not really safe with someone if you're not safe to battle. But then it's also weird because there is some sort of line there.
But then there, that's when you get into the question of grace and forgiveness. That's so big and like the sunflower, like leading into religion and Hegel and so on. And so it's all quite, quite a lot there. But there is something about the, but the battle is the friendship, which is the game, which all suggests that these are the things of something like highest reality. Because we were asking, what is reality? And what do we do if reality is all hallucination? Well, what if reality is actually a game that is in a sense arbitrary, but in that arbitrariness, it actually is authoritative and it actually is the substance of deepest friendship or deep or deepest philosophy. Like it's almost like we've got all the categories blurred in a way that makes it difficult to think this. And then the question of when is a person doing what they can is tied to the question of if they are bringing about a game in the Nietzsche and or Hegel, if they're bringing about creativity, if they're bringing about play in this kind of quality of interaction. And it's almost like what you judge. Well, that's kind of interesting. I've given it's almost like what you judge when you're interacting with someone and you feel like they're not doing what you can. It is almost like what you judge is that they're not creating this condition of safety in battle or flow or game or play or indirectness. That is in fact what you're kind of feeling like is not there. And that and you're like, it could be there though. It can be there pre precisely because in a way it's arbitrary, thus non-contingent, thus anyone can do it. It's precisely because it actually has this ability to be added to anything that you're like, you could do it. But then, of course, there are conditions of being able to create games. And I guess that's getting into the topic of virtue and different things. So it's interesting. All these things, it's like tied to this question of the determination of are people doing what they can do actually being tied to the question of this game dynamic being missing, which is this feeling of freedom in the battle. So I appreciate what you were saying, Dimitri. And let me pass. I can't tell if it's an hour later or earlier in Europe and all around the world because we in America pride ourselves on daylight savings time because we're great. Uh, but let me pass it to Mr. Jockin and the Jacob Kassir. Mr. Jockin. Great points as always, everybody. You know, Daniel, I'm, I'm surprised you didn't bring in your term conditional. I'm very surprised because I figured it's the pro, this is like the obvious point, like segue to bring it in. Um, and I say it because, it, like, to use the arbitrary necessity distinction for this point, but draw it out. Things can come from conditioned environments to become necessity. Aristotle talks about it. Hypothetical material necessity. He talks about it in physics. The example he uses is the house, right? The house for this. The reason why is the brick used on the walls? Why is it? Why is the hay being used on the ceiling? Because of material necessity, right? The lightness and heaviness of the material. But why is there a house at all? It's to shelter. And if and thus, what they mean by that hypothetical necessity is to say, if one wants a house, one must do X. There's a kind of conditional if then cause causational argument made from a conditional. It's a completely arbitrary. It's as arbitrary. You say, yeah, you want a shelter. You could do, you could want something else. These are hypotheticals. Um, so that's a really interesting point because games by definition are that. They are hypothetical necessities. The game of, for example, soccer. You get to get what's the goal of the game? Kick the ball in the other net. Okay, but then you have to but if they do that, then you have those conditions that get stacked on top. And by just a very limited set of rules, syntax rules and syntax. You get this now compilatory magic of creativity uh, that blows up, basically. That not blows up in a good way. It creates possibility, excellence, cultivation. Um, so that actually answers one of the questions of basically where does virtue in terms of station come from? One of the answers could be a hypothetical necessity. There's a Under a certain context, you're in this environment. You chose to enter this the, the, the contest, basically. And therefore, there's a certain rules, grammar, and syntax of how one carries that oneself. But the genius is the one also that know, kind of absorbs those principles in syntax and grammar and can overcome them and actually make them better or, or elucidate them in a way unexpected. Um, I also, Dermitri's comment, I, I don't know if he's still here. Yeah, he is, good. Uh, Dermitri, that comment about attacking as a hello, you know, in boxing, we use a... We use a of ma uh, we have a saying for that when we start a, usually in the first round of a sparring session, especially. So thus, there's not the intent to kill, uh, not, not to knock each other out with, with, with full force. Uh, we literally say, we're going to say hello to each other with, with jabs. Like our jab, it, we, when we say jab, say hello to him, we're, what we're saying there is, yeah, give him a jab. Uh, give, him some, give him some jabs. 
And actually, a lot of times, like I've said as many, I think I'm definitely in this group, but I think in other places too. In boxing, we are absolutely communicating with our, like with the spar. The fight is absolutely communication. I've sparred people. Um, you can tell easily when someone who's like, you can sense intent very clearly. You can sense the skill level difference almost within a round, easy within half, within half a round. You can tell a skill difference really quickly. Uh, and that changes the whole dynamic and tenor of the, of the contest. If I'm sparring someone that's clearly not my level, I am not, it, it's on, it's like up beneath me to go full force. That's on, that's like really inappropriate. Uh, because why are you going to put your full force on this guy? who can't even dodge your jab. Like as an example, that's why we do that. We kind of have a protocol of how we interact with each other because out of respect, but also out of sensing what level this other person is, you don't know. So you find out very quickly and you respond in accordance. It gives you certain normative expectations as a result. I mean, it's no different. It's the same reason. That's the thing is like, there's like certain bounded trust because you're in a bounded relationship of the game. So for example, like if you get that, you get knocked out and you're on the ground. You're, you're no, no one's, you're, you're no one's to hit you again. That's the end of the conversation. Um, it's not like in a real street fight. There's absolutely no rules and it's a free for all. Um, yeah. And it's kind of, isn't that interesting? It's kind of nature of law abiding. Like we need the law. We need, we need this kind of rule syntax grammar. Um, and it's both generate. It's interesting. Kind of that question, right? Where does it come from? Does it come from external rule? Uh, like one make the argument that be arbitrary if it came from an outside force imposing a rule set onto it. But if the rule set is coming from the specific grammar of the actuality of the activity, then that's not arbitrary at all. It's absolutely hypothetical necessity. So that's a really interesting drawing out on that point um, right there. I'll close with that. Oh, actually, one last note. And by the way, besides sports, I had another note because I've been getting very interested in geometry lately. You know, a great example of that. Is there, I, mean, I don't think it's not surprising that Plato uses geometry to depth, like in the discussion of virtue in Mino. There's a, I don't think it's an accident at all. I just say that because, quite frankly, the it is an absolute kind of conditional mode to draw geometry because it's an arbitrary. You just make a point, okay, and then get a string. Have a rot, put a rotate that string around a full amount. You got yourself a circle. Draw three of them. Now you got yourself a equilateral triangle, for example. This all generates from a completely quasi arbitrary but really more conditional starting point it's conditional and then from there you draw out these abstract shapes called geometry kind of interesting right that we think are this absolute necessity of geometry right of these shapes are pure necessity uh coming from a conditional starting point so thus hypothetical exam hypothetical necessity demonstrated again um that's what i got Dimitri has a question for you, so I'll give it to him. But you're right. I should have brought up the conditional, and I really like the phrase hypothetical in the sentence. Um, I really like this idea of greeting with jabs because very often you do, in fact, jab your friends as soon as you see them. Uh, you give them a hard time. Michelle will tell you I like kick J.B. Potter when he comes by. And I really like this idea as well on life is there's something here. I did drop the ball on not using the conditional word on hypothetical necessity. It's almost like what life is about is rising to the occasion of certain hypothetical necessities. And those in the question of are the necessities actual or hypothetical, that, that almost seems like that's not the right question. It's instead, what are the hypothetical necessities needed to create these spaces of battlefield is safe space or the ability to flow or move toward people in this way that we are describing friendship and and then it's like, that's almost like virtue as rising to the occasion of meeting those hypothetical necessities. That's a really interesting point. Okay, so today today I was watching this interview with this uh, German uh, Hegelian, uh, yeah, whatever. And then she said, oh yeah, I had a few questions. And then it turns out Hegel tarried with these questions. So naturally, I, I went to Hegel. And I was like, damn, that's not why I went to Hegel at all. Like, I was like, <laughs> when I think like, why the fuck did I go to Hegel out of all people? I'm like, I wasn't even at the point that I knew what question to ask. Like, I, my question was like, what questions are we even going to ask? Like, what is the right question to ask? And I think this like other point of hysteria that you're like, not even certain about, oh, this is basically what I want to work with has something to do with what I went to Hegel. I don't That's, know what you guys think about it. You know, sometimes they say, oh yeah, philosophy, you're asking questions. To me, it's like, no, nah, philosophy is like where you don't even know where the right question is. Now, when you're in this mode of unknowing. 
I, I actually think that's really good. I'll give it to Jacob because I agree with that. Like I went to philosophy because I didn't know what I even needed to know. Like I didn't even know what to ask. And I think you go into friendship because you don't even know what you don't. There's a different, there's an entirely different mode. I think that's very, like there's hypothetical necessities and you don't know what they are, but you know that they're there somehow. There's an intuition. That's very deep. Um, let me give it to Jacob and then uh, and then Javier, unless you have something more to say, Dimitri, but let me give it to Jacob. Jacob, can share. I wasn't sure where that was going to go, Dimitri, but I like where I ended up um that feels that feels like the ground of philosophy for me as well um a lot of interesting threads bubbling up in the last five minutes of this conversation around competition life as a game um observing my own experience that <clears throat> there are certain junctures at which um i'm not properly treating life as a game <clears throat> And in those junctures, there's a way in which I can kind of move to like a, a begin again kind of modality. And when I'm beginning again, I'm kind of coming back into right relationship with the game of life to play. And the question is kind of like, what game do I want to play in this, in this lifetime? Um, a lot of the systems and narratives surrounding us, um, financial systems, debt systems, different kind of systems, all tend towards um, eliminating, eliminating our sense that things are a game and reducing the game, the game, the game possibility of life. And there's something about um, <clears throat> really intense mystical experiences, death experiences, um, deep meditation insights and things of this nature, which allow that kind of deep, deep reset of the sensibility that those systems inculcate, which actually really reduces our game, game playing sensibility. And so I find that that kind of zeroing, that kind of beginning again to be the most optimal position with which I can begin to play the game um play the game again and then for some reason i'm thinking of a an instagram reel i saw of snoop dogg talking about not competing with other people and that he competes ultimately with himself and that that's an ongoing competition throughout life so then kind of putting those two pieces together there seems to be a right balance between taking the game seriously enough, but not too seriously. Competing as if it matters, as if you want to bring about the best performance in the game of this lifetime, whilst also remembering that it is just this lifetime. And there may be myriad, myriad other lifetimes. There may be eternal bliss on either end there may just be a void beyond all mystery but remembering all remembering those kinds of um levels of reality seems really important to not getting stuck when you're playing the game but you've lost the sense that it's a game and therefore it's become um really a kind of uh prison self-created and perpetuated um and so so much talk today about breaking out of the matrix and so on and so forth Game A, Game B, Infinite Games. This feels really, uh, really pertinent, and ultimately, it is at the level of our disposition, and uh, we hold that between all of us. That's an excellent comment. I'll pass it. If you want to speak again, Dimitri, please, and then Javier. And um, I think I'm really taken also by that idea that you're saying on taking things seriously but not too seriously. The sense of every like understanding that we need more game. Maybe the question of are do people doing what they can tied to the no they could they could hit that balance better no they could be more playful maybe it's tied to that and then philip also asked a tremendous question of of uh what about the game of war like on a macro picture if some people want to play wars others want to play peace what do you do there maybe what we need to do is think about ethics on the basis of what keeps the game alive or keeps games alive and that requires there not to be fear and if people are going to war and killing one another, there's anxiety and fear. So you don't have play. And then ironically, if you don't have play, you don't have soccer and you don't have battle. There's something interesting. It's like anxiety, like maybe politics needs to be thought about in terms of like what creates fear, anxiety and destroys games 
which then paradoxically destroys the conditions of battle, which are the conditions necessary for people to actually like grow creatively, which then in a funny way that uh, that would almost suggest that you need a politics to work against fear to open up battle that is creative. And we often actually associate battle as creating fear when maybe there's actually something different here. And Aspasia, good to see you. We're coming up on the close, dear Aspasia, but you're awesome. And uh, thank you for jumping in. And uh, I'm really interested because on this question, we have errands this evening, so we'll run around. But Grace is waving. Oh, Grace is dancing. Very good. Good to see you, Christian. And it's, it's interesting to think that maybe we need to think about global ethics, ethics, politics, in terms of the conditions of enabling people to reach hypothetical um, necessity that are the hypothetical necessity of virtue, of flow, of courage, of this ability to enter battles that have this kind of growing character to them. And that, and instead of asking questions of, and uh, yes, uh, Aspasia, thank you, despite the mauling of children, that's uh, fantastic. That's a wonderful double, what's the word? Uh, double, double do, doing multiple things, uh, multitasking. There we go. Um, and it's interesting because often we think about politics and creating peace, but what if instead it's the question of what is the global policy to create conditions by which there is not the anxiety that would then enable the possibility of play so that people can step into games and fields of battle where they can develop then the courage to not be afraid because they've act and that becomes a safe space from a place of being capable. And I think that's a kind of different orientation for policymaking and different things. But let me pass it to Dimitri and then Javier. Dimitri, please. Yeah, Jacob, what you said, I, I really see the truth in that, but I, I struggle with it constantly. And I think that struggle is also the truth of it, you know, because I'm like so fanatic, man. Like when we we go and play a game, like, yeah, like I, I will go for it. Like I will play with the game like it's like my life hinges on it, you know, um, but it's like to me. Sometimes people don't understand this, this about me. They get very upset. <laughs> you know, I'm like super fanatic, but I try also, you know, it's like I can, you know, to me, it's like you have to be fanatic, but also like be able to release that in like, you know, just like that. Like that's, that's to me, that's the, the, the skill, you know, can you like play the game and like lose yourself in it? And the next moment you're like totally out of it. And you're like, yeah, I'm indifferent to the game. I don't care about the game. I am not dependent upon the game. You know, like this kind of oscillation. I, I, I love playing. Uh, I love playing with it. So. No, now I'm thinking about Hegel's indifference, right? At the end, indifference. There's something about an indifference to a game that also then gives it a kind of creative power in a certain way, like knowing when to strike that. I think about that as well as a kind of skill is very, 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 very difficult. But let me give. Yeah, I mean, this has been good. I mean. Um what uh, Jacob said about stumbling into philosophy is not even knowing what question you wanted to ask. Um, I, I do think that is kind of what perhaps you could say even the impossible Hegelian slave dialectic or perhaps even the Buberin challenge is precisely that, to come in not knowing what question we're going to, we need to ask. But Ironically, that itself is a question. What what is the question? You know, <laughs> what what is the question? What is the good question? What is the what is the game that we're playing? Um, and it seems like when we talk about sports and everything, like Jockin kind of got at, and uh, is that the game can only exist in so far as we mutually acknowledge the game we're playing. I think when it comes to global politics, there seems to be always a debate about what game should we be playing. Um, but I do think the way Jacob answered this stumbling into philosophy might be the, the real question of, of phrasing it as what game do we want to play together without already debating what game, what game we should be playing. What game are we playing and what games should we be playing? Um, what game is this? That's the game. What game is this? <laughs> what, 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 are we, what are we doing? That, that's, a, that's a game. Um, 
it's almost like a hide and seek game. Where, where are you? Come find me. Uh, this this is this is a kind of game, um, and it hinges on kind of mutual acknowledgement. Of course, we understand from Hegel and even Buber that mutual acknowledgement is close to impossible. Um, and yet, ironically, it's what feeds the desire of the game. <laughs> you know, it feeds with the desire of the game, the desire to be acknowledged, the desire to participate in the game and be a part of reality. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think um, it's, it's, it's so ironic that even asking a good question is somehow ironically both inside and outside the question itself of reframing from preemptively knowing what the question actually is. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I found everything, what everybody said, very interesting. Um, and it kind of like just funny anecdote. I remember this just kind of goes with Dimitri's point a little bit, like how he felt like, yeah, I really feel like, you know, when someone denies my exclusivity, denies my participation in reality, it kind of reminds me of the, like that TikTok kind of, real where the, the the dad is talking to the son he's like how do you know reality is real like it could just be all whatever and then the son just walks up to him and just slaps him <laughs> um it's 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 funny because i mean in a, in a sense he's he's making a point but my interpretation of it is he goes it's funny that you thought you could just not include me in the reality <laughs> you know and that's just kind of like the reminder of the slap like it's funny that you could just think that you can just ignore antagonism <laughs> you can just ignore my own reality by saying how do you know it's just this is just all fake and, and jumbo and and so on so i thought that was a really funny like language game about this is just virtual um nothing's real um that's the kind of game that wants to exclude other games <laughs> but yeah i'll leave it there Outstanding, Javier, and uh, and I appreciate everyone being here uh, today. Uh, alas, like I said, we have errands that we will run out to. Um, I'm very. T it's almost like. It's almost like the problem is on this kind of idea of the game or playing the game or this question of are people doing what they could do. It's it's almost like what kind of hypothetical necessities do we want to impose upon ourselves as authoritative and then condition ourselves to. Like, what are the hypothetical necessities? Like, because once you enter sight, like once you choose to enter soccer as a hypothetical necessity, you have then chosen to let the rules of soccer have authority over you in that space. And there's a way in which the question of the game or the questions of what will be our hypothetical necessities. And that's kind of interesting because then it kind of avoids the question of what is objective reality? Right. And in fact, it says that question is it's almost like we were saying that if you go too direct at people, it's a disaster. You go too direct at um, it's too direct. Good to see you, Aspasia. And um, if it, you're too direct toward topics or people, it blows up and everything goes wrong. It's almost like it's the same with reality itself. If you go direct at it, you just get confused or like lost in giant philosophical systems. And instead, you need this kind of um, this kind of unfolding process that is actually the the question of what are the hypothetical necessities we will impose upon ourselves because we believe it is the best way to participate in the unfolding that is the indirectness and unveiling by which we then actually become more real. But real in that sense is precisely the capacity to enter into hypothetical necessities. And maybe because that's the real that we know as human beings making choices in different things. And maybe it's like on this question that Philip has asked on, are people doing what they can? It's a judgment of you could be creating hypothetical necessities and you're not. You could be rising to the occasions of games and you're not. And that's kind of what you're judging. You see that they are not imposing upon themselves hypothetical necessities. And, and, and then the reality is the human capacity to create hypothetical necessities. That's the reality. And so the reality you are judging, their capability according to, because Philip also brought the point up earlier as did Jock and on the note, this kind of idea that it's all relative to what is reality. 
by which you determine values, but then it's like, but you can't access seemingly reality. But it's like, it's as if the human reality is the capacity to create hypothetical necessities of some kind. And that's what you're kind of judging as them not doing. Um, and then global politics or different things are questions of does it create the space for that generation of hypothetical necessities, ergo games, ergo creative projects that you're taking very seriously, but also not so seriously that you take them personal because that's, that's also something you see when someone's on the soccer field and you, t and you trip them and they fall, if they get up and they're really personally angry at you, you feel justified to be kind of angry at them because they're treating something too seriously. That's what's kind of weird, right? There is a sense on the in the sport, in the hypothetical necessity, you get a sense of you're taking this too seriously. And yet there's also simultaneously uh, you're not putting in enough effort. Like all of that sounds like a contradiction, but actually in sports, you know it clear as day when you see it. Like, you know it clear as day if someone's like taking something personally on the bat on the battlefield, that's not appropriate for them to like get upset at you because you took the ball from them. But then you also see the kid who's just jogging down the field and you're like, you can do better than that. You can be sprinting. So in the field of the hypothetical necessity, you can kind of make determinations of those differences that seem indeterminable when you're talking about them outside the hypothetical condition. And that seems to be kind of what we're doing uh, when we're asking the question of if a person is doing what they can. Uh, it's questions of, are they imposing upon themselves hypothetical necessities by which then bring out a game that then actually creates a safe space of a field of battle that has unfolding and creative possibility. And relative to that hypothetical necessity, are they acting, are they doing what they can in terms of not taking things personally that they shouldn't and putting in the effort that they could put forth? And I think that then can get into questions of what it would look like for policy. I was also taken as a note by the phrase law abiding that Jochen said is if we abide in the law, we choose to live in the law. Well, that's another than hypothetical necessity. You turn the law into a hypothetical necessity and maybe then if we take all of this seriously, um, this notion of how to engage in pluralism and ethical difference, if everyone thinks about it as hypothetical necessities, maybe that will e help everyone hold their beliefs with sufficient looseness, but also sufficient solidness, the optimal grip, as Mr. Dr. Verveke will talk about. Maybe this kind of notion will help people hold things in the right way, so then when they encounter the other and they talk with the other, they're able to do it with the knee jerk in the same way that in sports, in soccer, you're able to fight without taking it personally, but also judge quality and who's putting an effort or not. Maybe thinking about all this as a hypothetical um, necessity would help this right way of engaging in the, the conversation uh, that Mr. Rivera was saying at the beginning that, that we need. And then maybe on this idea that philosophy is done when you go in not knowing the question, Maybe the key, maybe the other, the true other is the person of whom you go in not knowing how they are other. And the problem is we go in far too often with an idea of what is otherness? What are the questions we're finding the answers to? What is the other we're learning to um, relate with? When really we need to encounter the other as, I don't even know what otherness is. That's why I'm going and finding the other. I don't even know what it is that I need to be challenged by. That's why I'm putting myself in the presence of difference. Likewise, you go into philosophy going, I don't even know what the questions are I need to ask. That's why I'm going in. Maybe if we think of otherness as that which we need to approach as, I don't even know what otherness is. And I need that otherness to encounter the challenge that creates the condition of the hypothetical necessity that I need to actually unfold as a, few, a full human being, maybe that very schema in of itself will help us deal with the encounter of pluralism. Because when the other turns out to not be the other we thought we are, and they kind of surprise us, we go, oh, good, this is the other. This is what I need to bring out the worst in me so I can see if I have what it takes to wrestle it into something not monstrous, but creative. And that the very monstrosity of myself that can come out when it is pinned down by the difficulty of the other then becomes an invitation to create something uh, difficult that can be beautiful precisely because of that difficulty that has to be wrestled down. So I appreciate the conversation we will run. Thank you all. It's been a treat. I've appreciated it very much. All the best. All the best.